Take your, <clears throat> take your Bible this evening. You better help me out here, Dean, all right? Take your Bible this evening. Let's go to the book of Esther, if you will, please. And uh, what a good time in the book of Esther. Esther chapter 8 this evening. We'll actually be covering 8, 9, and 10. Of course, chapter 10 just is three, three verses. Uh, but we'll cover these together uh, this evening. And we're going to just go ahead and read chapter 8. See what the Lord has in store for us here this evening, all right? Esther chapter 8. On that day did King Ahasuerus give the house of Haman, the Jews' enemy, unto Esther the queen. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told him what he was unto her. And the king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it unto Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. And Esther spake yet again before the king and fell down at his feet, and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite, and his device that he had devised against the Jews. Then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king, and said, If it please the king, and if I found favor in his sight, and the thing seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews, which are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that shall come unto my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Let's stop there. Father, thank you for this evening now. We, uh, Lord, we're looking forward to going through these chapters tonight and uh, seeing this exciting conclusion. Uh, to the book of Esther. It's been amazing to, to see your hand at work and the hand of the providence of God and how you rule in the affairs of men. And you rise, raise up kings and you put kings down and you, you turn the heart uh, just as you want it to turn. And Lord, I'm, I'm praying that you'll open our understanding tonight now and help us to glean what we need to glean from these chapters here this evening as we wrap up this book of Esther tonight. So, Lord, help each of us to give our careful attention to what you would want to say to each of us this evening. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Well, Haman is dead. He's been hung on his own gallows, so the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Esther, Mordecai, and the Jews have all done what was right in the sight of God. Evil, which would be Haman, has been punished and the righteous are going to be rewarded. We're going to see that take place here. Let's look, number one, if you're filling out that paper tonight, is the promotion of Mordecai. The promotion of Mordecai. Did you notice in verse 1 of chapter 8, when we read it just a moment ago, on that day did the king Asiris give the house of Haman the Jews' enemy unto Esther the queen. And then it says, And Mordecai came before the king. For Esther had told what was what he was unto her. When when that little verse when it says he came before the king, that meant he was in the constant company of the king. Remember, there were just a a just a certain few that would be in the king's presence. They didn't need the scepter to be raised. Now they always had access to the king. Now Mordecai would be one of those. Who used to be in that position? Haman was, and now Mordecai is. Uh, he's taken up that spot. Look, look down in chapter 8 and verse number 15. Something else happened. Chapter 8, verse 15. Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white, and with a great crown of gold, and with a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. There again, the promotion of Mordecai. Look at chapter 9 and verse 3. And all the rulers of the provinces and the lieutenants and the deputies and officers of the king helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house and his fame went throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai waxed greater and greater. You see the promotion of Mordecai. You remember last week when 
the king couldn't sleep and he read out Mordecai, Mordecai had saved his life and, and then in the morning he decides what, what, he, what should, should be done to reward him and he hears somebody outside and he said, who's there? And it was Haman. And he asked Haman what should be done for the man in whom the king delights. You remember that? And Haman thought he's talking about me. And boy, he laid it on thick, you know, put him on your horse, put on your royal garments and your crown and all that stuff. And he said, okay, you do that for Mordecai. Remember, he had to take him to the city that day. And, and here's the man in whom the king delights. Here's the man in whom the king delights. And I'm sure there had to be guys there. People aren't that different not now than what they were then. There had to be guys there saying, I thought you were going to hang him. I thought he was going to be on the gallows. That's a funny looking gallows he's riding right there. Oh, I'm sure they rubbed it in, and he was humiliated. He was awful. And here's he's not, but you remember after that, all that was done, what did where did Mordecai go? You remember from last week? He went back to the gate. He went back to where he always was. He didn't say, Hey, I'm the big cheese now. Hey, I'm the big shot. Now I'm I'm I've been honored by the king, and the king thinks I'm somebody, man. I I, I don't need to go back to that little place. No, he just went right back to where he was. And we talked about how. You humble yourself, and God will exalt you. You try to exalt yourself, and He'll humble you. Now, look in chapter 10. Esther 10. Notice, it talks in, in verse 1, King Ahasuerus laid tribute upon the land and upon the isles of the sea, and, and all the acts of his power and of his might, and the declaration of the greatness of Mordecai, whereunto the king advanced him. Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was next unto King Ahasuerus, and great among the Jews, and accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people and speaking peace to all his seed. He's in second in command only to the king himself. Mordecai humbled himself and he was exalted. Haman lifted himself up and he was abased. He was humbled. Notice too, if you read in chapter 8 there in the beginning, he gave all of the house of Haman to Esther. And then Esther put Mordecai in charge of it. And when I, when I read that, the verse that came to my mind was, the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Uh, Haman piled all that wealth up uh, that he had and it all goes to God's people. The wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. The world is, you know, the world is really bent on self-promotion. Everybody trying to promote themselves. Look out for number one. And who's number one? Yourself. Everybody wants to talk about how, how wonderful they are. It was... Uh, it, it was good to hear, and, and nobody likes to talk about it in the media, but it was good to hear when the Philadelphia Eagles won the Super Bowl that several of the players, including the coach, gave credit to their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and, and just thank God for the opportunity He gave us. Nobody talked about how great they were, or how, how good a coach I am, or how good a player I am. Uh, they were trying to give all the credit and the glory to God. That's refreshing to, to see, especially among pro athletes. But Esther uh, gives that to uh, Mordecai the steward, and, and uh, Mordecai is, is humbled by it all. You know, even the disciples of Jesus, do you remember what they were arguing about one day? Who's going to be greatest in the kingdom? In fact, uh, James and John's mother even went to Jesus and said, how about my two boys sit one on your right hand and one on your left hand when you come into the kingdom? <laughs> I mean, they, they, they had no, con they, they just wanted to see who would be the greatest and Jesus had to pull them aside and teach them. Uh, the, the, that's the way the Gentiles work. That's the way the, the unsaved, the people who don't follow me, the people who aren't Christians, that's the way they operate, but that's not how you operate. You won't operate that way. You won't try to promote yourself. Could we, could we learn what Micah said in Micah 6.8 when he said we ought to, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God? You don't, you don't proudly walk with God. God resists the proud. 
He gives grace to the humble. Okay? When you, when you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. You know what's great? Did you catch it in chapter 10? When it says in verse number 3, that Mordecai the Jew was next king Asherus and was great among the Jews. He was great among the Jews, but notice the next, the next phrase, and accepted of the multitude of his brethren. He was, he was exalted by the king. He was great among the Jews. And guess what? They all accepted it. It doesn't say anybody was jealous about it. Anybody was upset that, hey, who's he? Who's he think he is? Even Moses and Aaron had their critics. Remember Korah and those guys? Who do you think they are? Who do you think you are taking all this on yourself? Well, they didn't think they were anyway. In fact, when you read about that in the Old Testament, there's a parenthesis there, and a parenthesis in the Bible is always the personal note from the author to the reader, and God tells us, now the man Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. So we know it wasn't Moses' pride. Moses wasn't trying to toot his own horn. God, and God, God showed up there when, and when, when the, the showdown came and, and the earth opened up and swallowed Korah and 250 of his followers. I think God was making it plain who he had chosen to be the leader, don't you? But that wasn't Moses, that was God. Moses just said, let's let God make the choice. And so, they was accepted of the brethren. They, they, said, they rejoiced that Mordecai got promoted. They were happy for him. When's the last time you got happy for someone who got promoted? When you got happy for someone who maybe someone was chosen to sing the special and you weren't. And you were happy for them. Someone got picked to teach the class and you didn't. And you were happy for them. You see? It, it, we're to rejoice with them that rejoice. When, when we get upset or we say, well, I could sing as good as they did it. Or I could do a better job on that than what they do. I could teach better than that. You know what we're doing? We're wanting to promote ourselves. When God, when God wants to get a hold of you, do you think God knows where you live? you think God knows your address? you think God has your cell phone number? I think God can get in touch with us, don't you? And that's why the Bible says in the Psalms, promotion doesn't come from the east or the west or from the south. Where's promotion come from? It comes from the north. It comes from God. Say so rejoice in His promotion. God rewards His servants. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Hebrews 11.6 For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. I, I don't just believe that God is, I believe He rewards those who seek Him. God rewards His servants. It's all through the Bible. Someone said, if heaven had a daily newspaper, the headlines would read quite differently than our headlines on earth. In other words, the good deeds that we don't get much credit for on earth would certainly make the front page in heaven's newspaper. Some of heaven's headlines might read, Catherine just changed her 10,000th diaper. Taking care of her children. Hey, Rodney just mowed the neighbor's grass. Hey, Tony got saved and started tithing. It probably made headlines that day Diane got saved. Diane Stotner got saved, started tithing. That makes headlines, not on earth, but it makes headlines in heaven. I'll guarantee you the day you got saved it made headlines. Because the Bible says there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents than 99 righteous people that Need no repentance. Maybe it reads that Gail took a meal to, sick, to a sick person or an unnamed widow put two coins in the treasury box. Headlines. You see, it's not just the big things we do that make headlines. It's the little things we do. That we think aren't a big deal. But they're a big deal to God. And a big deal in heaven. 
Because Jesus said, Inasmuch as you have done to one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. You've done it unto me. That means, you know what that means? That means that any of us can make headlines in heaven. Now, it's, it, you know, when uh, playing high school sports, it was always a big deal to get the paper on Saturday morning after the game Friday night and see if your name got mentioned in the paper. Hey, I got my name in the paper. Look at that. Huh? You ever had your name in the paper? I mean, besides wanted or, you know, you know break-ins, something like that, Brother Moreland. I don't mean that. Uh, yeah, and that's pretty cool, isn't it? Have your name in the paper? Hey, there's my name. How many of you have never gotten your name in the paper? Let me see your hand. Yeah, several of you. You know what's great? Your name very well could be in heaven's paper. God rewards his servants. God rewards his servants. God doesn't just want to save us from hell. God wants to reward us in heaven. All of Revelation 4 is about us gathering around the throne and we have the crowns that, that the Lord has given us. Now, we're going to cast them at His feet. But we receive those rewards. There are several rewards mentioned in the New Testament that the believer can get. Several crowns that we're able to win. And so God wants to reward us. And He wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't tell us about heavenly rewards if He didn't want us to get any. So there, there's a purpose for that. He could have kept it all a big secret and not told us until we got to the judgment day. But he didn't do that. He told us that there's things we do now that will be rewarded when we get to heaven. talks about how to be careful to maintain good works that we lose not our reward. There's incentives there. Now God wouldn't have to do that. Hey, to be saved would be enough. Had to be a man, that's great. But God is so good. He does exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think. And He says, I don't only save you and give you eternal life and prepare mansion for you, but I have rewards for you too. And we'll say, God, you're too good to me. You're too good. God gave us those, so much information about rewards. He reminded us through Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be therefore steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain. It's not empty. It's not for nothing. You're going to be rewarded. It's not for vain in the Lord. You will be rewarded if you just stay faithful and serve Him. The promotion comes in. The promotion may not come now. The promotion may not be till then. That's where I think the Bible says the first will be last and the last will be first. Some of the ones that we think were really, you know, big shots here, and we think, boy, they'll really get a big word in heaven. They may, they, they may start stepping up kind of like Haman would, you know. And the Lord will say, ho, 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 step back. And he may call that little widow woman out. Or he may call like, we'll learn Sunday morning, uh, he may call that lady who they call Dorcas up and say, no, you come up. Everybody's going to say, Dorcas, who's that? Never heard of her. Where's she in the Bible? Well, you come Sunday morning, you'll find that out. You see, uh, just, just don't, don't just serve him faithfully. Serve him humbly as Mordecai did. Let God deal with the promotion. I laugh sometimes at the, the phrase you hear sometimes, every, every now and then a congressman or a, uh, somebody in Congress will have a brush up at the airport security, you know, or, or maybe they get pulled over for drunk driving or something, and, and their famous line is always, don't you know who I am? Don't you know who I am? Yeah, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Uh, by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's all we are. And without Him, we can do nothing. And so we're just serving God. We'll let God take care of the promotion part. Amen? So Mordecai gets promoted. Now, I want you to see number two, the protection of the Jews. Back at chapter 8 again. The protection of the Jews. Esther now is going to intercede 
to the king to reverse the letters devised by Haman to exterminate the Jews. So she asked the king to do that. When we stopped reading in verse 6, she said, uh, in verse 6, how can I endure to see the evil that shall come unto my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Then the king, as here it said unto Esther the queen, and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they have hanged upon the gallows, because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews, as it liketh you, in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring. <coughs> Excuse me in the king's name, and, and for the writing which is written in the king's name, and sealed with the king's ring, may no man reverse. Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, that is the month Sivan, on the three and twentieth day thereof, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews, and to the lieutenants, and the deputies, and rulers of the provinces, which are from India unto Ethiopia, 127 provinces unto every province according to the writings thereof and unto every people after their language and to the Jews according to their writing and according to their language. All right, so the decree now goes out and, and hey, he gives to Mordecai what he gave to Haman. Now, Haman had to promise him a bunch of money, remember? <laughs> no money involved here. He just said, you write as you like. As you like, you word it any way you want. And here's my ring, here's my signet, we'll seal it, and nobody can reverse it. And so uh, Mordecai writes the new decree for the king and basically gives the Jews the right to defend themselves and their property. Some were already figuring, the, the, the actual day that Haman had proclaimed what happened was still nine months away. However, there were some figuring, well, it's going to happen anyway. And especially when you have a kingdom that that's vast and that wide, some thought they would just hurry the process up. And they were going ahead and attacking some of the Jews anyway and trying to kill them and take whatever they had. So we find out as this uh, decree goes out, A, the enemies of the Jews in Shushan are destroyed. The enemies of the Jews in Shushan, the, the palace or the capital there, are destroyed. Notice chapter 6, I mean chapter 9, verse number 6. And in Shushan the palace, the Jews slew and destroyed how many? 500 men. Now, Verse 7 and verse 8 and verse 9 list the sons of Haman. And I'm not going to read their names. Okay? I'm not going to do that. So these are the ten sons. Verse 10. The ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, slew they, but on the spoil laid they not their hand. And the, the, on that day, the number of those that were slain in Shushan the palace was brought before the king. And then he's going to talk to uh, the Esther again uh, about uh, anything else that she wants. And uh, he talks about, she said, yeah, in verse 13, if it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews that are in Shushan today uh, to do tomorrow, also according unto this day's decree, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. And the king commanded it to be done. And the decree was given at Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. And then, of course, they didn't, again, they didn't lay hands on the spoil. Look at verse 16. But the other Jews that were in the king's provinces gathered themselves together and stood for their lives and had rest from their enemies and slew of their foes seventy and five thousand, but they laid not their hands on the prey. On the thirteenth day, of the month Adar, and on the fourteenth day of the same rested they, and they made it a day of feasting and gladness. So the enemies in Shushan are destroyed, and the ten sons of Haman hung on the gallows. The second part is the enemies of the Jews were destroyed throughout all the kingdom. And in this case, 75,000 were killed. Now when that took place, they established a feast. 
It's called the Feast of Purim. P-U-R-I-M. You read about that from about verse 20 all the way through verse 29 of chapter 9. For the sake of time, I I won't read all that, but I will read uh, if you look with me at verse number 26. Wherefore, they called these days Purim, after the name of Pur. Therefore, for all the words of this letter and of that which they had seen concerning this matter and which had come unto them. The Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed, upon all as such joined themselves unto them, so it should not fail, and that they would keep these two days according to their writing, according to their appointed time every year, and that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city, and that these days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed." And Esther, the queen, the daughter of Abihail, and Mordecai the Jew, wrote with all authority to confirm the second letter of Purim. And he sent the letters unto all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Assyrus with words of peace and truth. All right? So the, the, the feast of Purim was established. Purim means lot, L-O-T. They, remember when they were trying to decide when should we kill all the Jews? Haman cast lots. Kind of like uh, drawing straws, basically, is what casting lots was. And they said, well, uh, they, they, they named it Purim, lots, that who really is in control of the lot? God was. God's in control of those things. And so they, they, they kept that feast in the month of Adar, uh, a month of, uh, which was going to be a month of sorrow and mourning, and instead it ends up being a month of joy and celebration. Now, Uh, It's a day of feasting and joy, it says down in verse 17, for the Jews, a day of feasting and gladness for them. It was a day, they said, that they would give gifts to one another and gifts to the poor. It's really a day of feasting and joy and presents and gifts because God's people are saved from destruction. We're saved from ruin. And they're so happy and so joyful They have to celebrate. Remember when the decree went out the first time? Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and a great wailing. And remember, Esther didn't know what was going on. She's in her own palace there. And remember, she sent a change of clothes out for him so he could come in and tell her what's going on, and he refused them. And he sent her a writing of the decree. He sent her a copy of it. And all the Jews throughout all the provinces begin to wail and weep and put on sackcloth. Now, what a change. Now they're not wailing and weeping anymore. They're feasting and they're glad and they're happy and they're joyful. Why? Good news. We're not going to be destroyed. Good news. There's a Savior. We've been delivered from sure and certain death. Now, the Feast of Purim is still celebrated by the Jews today. It continues. The book of Esther doesn't give any commands for its celebration, other than it's a time of feasting and joy and to give presents of food to one another and gifts to the, fo- gifts to the poor. The, the main ceremony of Purim among the Jews is they read the book of Esther in the synagogue. They read the book of Esther. And it's, it's interesting when, they, when, when Haman's name is read from the scroll of Esther, it's met by a thunderous roar of clapping, stamping of the feet, booing, and the grinding noise of twirling noisemakers. That's how they always respond to His name whenever it's read. And they they relive all the miraculous events that took place in the book of Esther. During Purim, a plate full of cookies or uh, uh, cakes, pastries, fruits, nuts is sent to friends. And it's customary to give charity to at least two needy individuals during Purim so that they could enjoy the festivities as well. So it's a time of great joy, rejoicing, and gladness. It's the the happiest, the merriest uh, event on the Jewish calendar. All right? So that's the the protection of the Jewish people. A new decree has gone out. Now we're going to talk about how it gets to everybody. Number three is the propagation of the command. 
How does it get out? How does it get propagated? The decree has been signed, the deliverance from death, that the Jews are not going to be annihilated, they're not going to be destroyed, but you've got to get it out to everybody. How are they going to... 127 provinces, India to Ethiopia, you're talking about a lot of territory to cover. You didn't just put it out on the internet. You didn't just they put it on Facebook and Instagram and you know Twitter and uh, let's let, that, that'll cover it. Let's call in the networks, hold a news conference, and have anything like that. How are we going to get this word out to everybody so that it so that they'll get the word that they've been delivered? Well, let's look in chapter eight again, and notice with me first in verse number ten. So he wrote. This is Mordecai now. He wrote in King Ahasuerus here's his name and sealed it with the king's ring. And here it is. He sent letters by posts on horseback, and riders on mules, camels, and young dromedaries. Dromedaries, I had to look that up. That's just a certain species of camel. All right? More Arabic uh, in, in its origin. So it's just another type of camel or young camel. And so they, they, they put it by the posts on these animals. And you see that again in verse number 14. So the post that rode upon the mules and the camels went out, being hastened and pressed on by the king's commandment. And the decree was given at Shushan the palace. So the decree is signed, it's sent out by these posts on horseback. These men on horseback are going to ride this thing out in camels and mules, whatever they can find. And, and they're hasted and they're pressed on by the king's commandment. The application is pretty clear, isn't it? Think about that. We were under the command of death. We were under the death sentence. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. God had commanded it. It was by one man sinning into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And we had that sentence of death upon us. But then another command came. And the command came that that sin debt had been paid for. That that death had been taken care of by a substitute. And His name was Jesus Christ. And He paid the debt for us. And now we don't have to have that debt. We don't have to pay the debt. If we'll call upon the name of the Lord, we'll be saved, we'll be spared. We won't have to be annihilated. We won't be destroyed. We have the good news. But we have to get the good news out. People have to know about it. We can't, we can't let them go around thinking they're still under the curse of sin and they're under the penalty for sin. They'll die in their sin if they don't get the good news. Pardon is, is assured if they'll receive the good news, but they have to know. And guess what? The letter's been given to you and me. We've been entrusted with the letter. Are we hasted and pressed on by the king's commandment to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? To go tell the good news? Hey, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Oh, we don't just have 127 provinces to get it to. We've got the world to get it to. But listen, we don't have to ride horses and camels and mules to get it to them. We have so much at our disposal to communicate the gospel to people. Tonight, if you wanted to, you have something in your hand or something in your home that you could get on and you can talk to somebody on the other side of the world and give them the gospel. Brother Bowman was sharing with me tonight about a man he knows in India where Brother Yoder's going to be. And he said, you just find out exactly who he's going to be with and I'll message the guy. He's going to talk to a guy on the other side of the world. Thousands, 9,000 miles from here. It's unbelievable. The day in which we live. They got the word out and how long it's taking us to get it out. They were pressed. They had nine months. But nobody here said, hey man, let's take the, let's take the scenic route. We've got time. No, they were pressed. Paul said, I press toward the mark of the prize. They were putting some pressure on themselves. Let's get this out the sooner 
the better. How many people, listen, how tragic is it for the first time anybody if, would hear the name of Jesus Christ would be when they're in hell? And they can't do anything about it. They never heard of a Savior. Didn't know there was a, someone who died for their sins. Because we're so caught up in our world and our things and our niceties and our pleasures and our comforts, we just never got around to telling. It's a pressing matter. It's life and death. These people knew that. These posts knew it. They said, we've got to get there. If we don't get there, people are going to die. Folks, if we don't get the Gospel to the world, people are going to die and go to hell. That's our responsibility. We've been given the decree. We have to take the message. Notice how glad and happy it made the Jews. Did you notice in chapter 8? Verse number 15, when, they, when Mordecai went out from the presence of the king and he was arrayed in the royal apparel of blue and white and a great crown of gold. And, and it says at the end of that verse, the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. Notice what it says in verse 16. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. Oh, how happy they were they got the news. Do you remember how happy you were when you got the news? Remember how happy you were when you heard, hey, wait a minute, you mean I can be saved? You mean I can have eternal life? I don't have to die and go to hell? I don't have to go pay for my sins and suffer? You mean Jesus paid that for me and just by calling on Him I can be saved? Yeah, I'll be saved. And you called on him and got saved. And man, you remember how though everything just seemed brighter and cheerful and happy? There's never been anybody who got saved and said, nah, I got saved. <laughs> no. Boy, you say, you may not have known what happened to you. You may not have understood all what happened to you. But I tell you what, I knew something happened to me. I knew something took place. I was it, it just... It, it, they, were, they were happy. Oh, happy day that fixed my choice on Thee, my Savior, and my God. I'm so, I'm so happy, and here's the reason why. Jesus took my burdens all away. Now I'm singing as the days go by, Jesus took my burdens all away. Once my heart was heavy with the load of sin. See, now it's no longer Jesus took the sin away. Gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. What a joy. What gladness. We've been spared. You've been pardoned. You realize there's few that be saved. And you got in on it. We got in on it. Wow, somebody ought to be happy about that. We ought to be glad about that. <coughs> How sad that we're so sad. How sad that we don't rejoice and let people know why we're rejoicing. We ought to be glad and happy as they were. Notice verse 16 again when it says the Jews had light and gladness. Light makes sense, doesn't it? They've been living under the gloom and the darkness of judgment. And now the light. Light in the Bible always means spiritual direction. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we walk in spiritual direction. When the Bible says we walk in darkness, that means we walk in with no spiritual direction at all. And the man who's lost walks in darkness. He has no spiritual direction from God at all. But we walk in the light. And, and Jesus said, I am the light of the world. We walk in the light. We walk in Jesus as He's in the light. We have fellowship one with another. The good news is always described as light. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But if my deeds are not evil, I love light rather than darkness. And we ought to walk like we're in the light. They had light. I love that. Then I want you to notice the result 
of the decree and the Jews' happiness over it. What was the result? Look at verse 17. Oh, this is good. And in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness and a feast and a good day. Now watch this next sentence. Are you ready? And many of the people of that land became Jews. <laughs> wow! Do you get that? Many of the people of the land became Jews. Hey, the Jews had joy and gladness and a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews. So man, they looked at them and said, man, if, that's, if it's that good and it makes you that happy and it makes you that glad and it brings you that much joy, I want to be like you. I want what you have. Have you ever exuded so much of Christ and, and let Christ come out in your joy and the happiness of the Lord that somebody said, man, I don't know what you got, but I want some. Where most of us are pretty poor advertisements for Jesus. How many would want to be a Christian because they know you or me? How good of an advertisement are you for the gospel of Jesus Christ? I mean, they, they had such joy and gladness and a feast and a good day. How many times do you have people tell you, have a good day? You know, would you say, you know what? I couldn't be having a better day unless I went to heaven. That's the only way it could get better. They would just look at you and say, you know, they, they, listen, they would have to look and say, is there such a life as that? Is that really real? Yes, it's real. It's a wonderful life. Jimmy Stewart didn't have a wonderful life. We have a wonderful life. Being a Christian. As sinners, we had a law that was written against us. Death to sinners. The law was unchangeable. Not because of the custom of the kingdom, but because of the character of the king. God is holy and that is unchangeable. So God's character can't change, neither could His condemnation of sinners. So God wrote a new law. He wrote a new covenant. And He wrote it with the blood of His only begotten Son. Remember, Jesus on the night before He died passed around the cup and He said, this is the new, new Testament in My blood. This is a new covenant that I'm making with you. And that new covenant superseded the old one. See? And that new covenant is us coming to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. We got in on that. How did, how did I get in on that? You know how I got in on that? Somebody told me. How did you get in on it? You know how you got in on it? Somebody told you. Somebody was hasted and pressed on by the king's commandment. That's the way we ought to be. Let's spread the word. Let's get the word out. Let's get the good news out every way we can. Let's let somebody know the good news. They've heard the bad news. Let's tell them the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful book of Esther. Thank you, Lord, even as this second decree goes out, you remind us that a new covenant has been given to us. A declaration that the wages of sin is death, but there's a gift from God that's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, help us to be hasted and pressed on by the King's commandment to go into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. Lord, I'm asking You to bless Jack and Sherry Jarvis as they fly out tomorrow. Please give them safety as they go back to Roatan and they begin to join arms and hands again with Adam and Alicia and the work You've called them to, God. Help them to spread the good news throughout that island. 
the good news that there's salvation in Jesus Christ. But Lord, remind us that we're all missionaries here tonight. As soon as we walk out the doors of this church building, we're in the mission field. And everywhere we go, where we work, where we live, where we go to school, where we shop, there's folks who need to hear the good news. May we be good advertisements for the Gospel of Jesus Christ. As David prayed, would you restore unto us the joy of our salvation? And may others see it and say, I'd like to be like that. Dismiss us now with your care. Lord, give us safety as we travel over the roads home now. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.